Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to once again welcome all of my church family and friends here to Mount Pleasant Seventh-day Adventist Church, those of our friends and our church family that's online. Once again, it is my duty to stand before you and stand in the gap to say a word for the Lord. And uh, I don't care how many times you do this, you know, you, you, you have to think to yourself, you know, it's an, an awesome responsibility. Amen. And uh, I pray that um, the Holy Spirit will, will be with me. As a matter of fact, will you, will you bow your heads with me again? Heavenly Father, we're thankful to you for waking us up to see this another day, another Sabbath day, and for your blessings, your mercy, and your grace toward us, and for starting us on our way and for bringing us here safely without accident, harm, or loss, or danger. And we pray that uh, as you speak through me today that your words will be um, honored and glorified and, and not my own. And help us, Father, that we will put into practice those things which you would have us to do in the way that you would have us to live in this day, that we take from this place something that we will share with others to help people have a closer relationship with you. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you who, who, who know me quite well, some of this will probably be deja vu because there are things about science and uh, in the STEM world that are just so fascinating to me that I think about them quite a bit. And I, you hear me talk about them uh, quite a bit in some of my discourses. And maybe some of what you'll hear today is something that you've uh, parts of which you've heard in the past, but I think sometimes things are worth, uh, that are worthwhile are worth repeating again and again. Now, I just want to say this. You know, it appears to me that um, in this day and age that uh, in all the things that are happening, one of the things that is, um, that's in the background is that there's a concerted effort to diminish the Word of God. I see it woven into the fabric of our society. Um, you know, years ago, maybe a, a few centuries back, more of our, our people here and other places in the world would have a higher esteem for, for, for the word of God. But it seems like as we get more and more forward in time that the Bible is not held in the same esteem that it was, that it had in times past. What I want to tell you all, and which has already been said, Ms. Mary Beth and uh, Christine, that this book, this book right here, is the most important book that you can ever imagine. Amen. It is more imp Amen. important than any other book in the history of all books. That's right. This is the Word of God, and it, in it is our instructions, not only for this life, but for the life to come. And so. Um, the, t the, the title of this discourse today is Science and the Bible, or Science and the Word. And I, as I've said, I've spoken some of this before, but there are some of you who have, haven't heard it, so this will be your first time. For those of you who have heard some of it, you'll get, a, you'll get another dosage, all right? So as most of you are probably aware, I have the privilege of working as a mechanical engineer in my field. I work for um, the Lansing Board of Water and Light, and I have a healthy fascination with how the world works, and particularly, particularly as it relates to the stuff that, the building blocks, the matter, and the energy, and the forces, and machines, and engines, planetary motion, and on, and on, and on, and on. I want to share with you, underneath the ground between two European countries of France and Switzerland, lie a circular tunnel that is about 16.6 miles in circumference, mm -hmm. all right? This tunnel consists of thousands of tons of concrete and steel. It houses structures that contain miles and miles of piping, wires, cables, and conduits. This tunnel has some of the most sophisticated laboratory equipment known to man. And here are some of the brightest minds in physics and mathematics conduct cutting-edge experiments that help to quantify the nature and the composition and the behavior of matter. This sophisticated laboratory is operated 
by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, otherwise known as CERN. How many have ever heard of CERN, C-E-R-N? You've heard of CERN? Some of you have, some, maybe some of you haven't. The main piece of equipment that is housed in this tunnel is called a particle accelerator. It's the main thing that is there. It's a particle accelerator. And the scientists here, they study very, very small things. Particles, subatomic particles. Small light atoms of hydrogen gas are injected into the accelerator. And with the aid of super cool, super conducting magnets, the atoms, these atoms, these small particles are accelerated around the tube. What they do is they, in an accelerator, you you have a vacuum that takes out all of the air and the other gases and so forth. And so then you put in these gases um, and then you're able with the accelerator to accelerate these things close to the speed of light. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they're, and you can imagine that, that these atoms are whizzing around at almost the speed of light. And, uh, and they, then what they do is they smash them into each other. They allow them to smash together because Right now, this is the only way that we know, as, as men that, that live on this earth, to smash atoms and to break them into their sub-components uh, so that you can study um, the effects and the behaviors of them. So it was once thought that the smallest units of matter were, were atoms, years ago, when they started atomic theory. And then scientists discovered that the atoms consisted of protons, neutrons, and electrons. You remember studying about in chemistry about protons, neutrons, and electrons, and things of that nature? But as knowledge of these fundamental units has increased and the equipment to make new discoveries was co constructed, smaller and smaller elementary particles have been discovered. So some of these particles have some strange names. You know, scientists have now discovered proton, protons themselves are made up of things that they call quarks yeah. and gluons. They have other names too, like mesons and um, all, kinds of, all kinds of different names. Um, they have some that are called up quarks, down quarks, top quarks, bottom quarks, strange quarks, and charm quarks. Because as they find each new elementary <laughs> particle, they try to give it some, some distinct name to give it a characteristic so they can classify it. So they have to come up. And so they've even given colors to the, even though it doesn't represent a physical color, they even say the color of this quark is, is such and such. Now, the interesting thing is that every particle has characteristics that are unique to it. No matter how far they smash down and they go to the elementary, as right, everything, every particle has, it has a charge, it has a spin, it has an orientation. And what, what, am, what am I getting at here? It appears to me that every particle has a purpose or an order or a function, signifying that there must be some master designer. Amen. Everything, every particle has some purpose, some, no matter how far down you split it, and, you, and you, you can identify this as a unique piece, it has some element or something that describes it, yes. which means it has some order or some purpose or some, some function. So the, these things just um, fascinate me to no end. And, and, and not only in this field, but I'm fascinated by many, many fields. I think of carpenters and builders, such as Mark, and I think of farmers as the butchers. I think of doctors, mechanics, teachers, counselors, plumbers, electricians. The list goes on and on. And I must tell you that the more that I come to know, the more I realize how much I don't know in life. Amen. However, I must say with great joy that the more I discover about our world and its inner workings, its complexities and intricate details, the more I am convinced that there is a God. Yes. Not only that there is a God, but God who took the time to carefully and wonderfully put things together in their order and in their places. And like all of you, I wonder how can there be so many 
who believe in an evolutionary process based upon completely random, mindless events, being the precursor to what we know to be our world and our universe. I can't, I, it's, it's hard for me to fathom that. And I'm not trying to, to, to um, disparage people who, who believe in those types of theories, but they are theories, and that's all they are. You know, it's, it's, it appears that today, in our world today, that what is theory is taught as fact in our schools and um, in the colleges and so forth. Thank God for our little church school here with our principal, Carly, Amen. where the young people can read the Bible and the Bible stories, and they can learn about the God who created this world and the universe. Herein lies the insidious nature of the, what I call the master deceiver. If he can be successful in saturating our world with twisted viewpoints of the origins of the universe, he will be more and more successful in turning people's minds away from the master designer. Amen. Now I'm talking about the master deceiver versus the master designer. Amen. He will turn people's minds away and his, uh, of, his loving and his, of his love and saving grace which is his ultimate goal. The master deceiver doesn't want us to know anything about the true God who created this world and the nature and his nature. You will note on TV and in articles the term science versus the Bible. <laughs> science versus the Bible, as if the two are at odds with each other. Well, in a sense it is, because if it's not true science, it is at odds with the Bibles. But true science is not at odds with the Bible. Okay, this is a clever, effective deception. True science and true education are in complete harmony with the Bible. And as I said, the science and the Bible agree. The divine author of the Bible is also the author of science, true science. I want to just share with you some texts here, and you can write these down. It won't, won't take time to, to, uh, to turn to all of them, but I have many of them here that reference science in the Bible, perhaps maybe in a way that you hadn't thought of, but when you go, when you look at them and you study them with other texts, you can understand that, hey, this, there's a scientific component to this. So I wanna share some of these with you. Now in, in science, we have different branches of science. We have astronomy, we have physics, we have meteorology, we have biology, we have all kinds of matter of science, of, and I'm gonna to touch on all of these. So I'm gonna start with statements that are consistent with astronomy. Now, what is astronomy? Astronomy is the branch of science that deals with what we call celestial objects. Celestial objects, space, and the physical universe as a whole. That's, what the, that's a branch of science that's called astronomy. So the Bible frequently refers to the great number of stars in the heavens. And this was long before people could understood that there were this huge number of stars. I mean, you could look up in the night sky back in Bible times and you could see many stars, but everything is relative. Because at the time, with the naked eye, they probably could see a few hundred, maybe a thousand, maybe a couple thousand stars with the, with the naked eye. But the Bible says in Genesis twenty two seventeen, blessing I will bless you, Genesis twenty two seventeen, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants, as God talking about Abraham, as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. Now, if you think about sands that are on the seashores, that's a lot of stars. That's a lot of stars. Now think about this. Jeremiah 33, 22, it also says this, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. Here's that term again, sand of the seashore. When scientists first started discovering galaxies, they could think the number that they thought was there were in the thousands. And as we got better and better uh, sophisticated telescopes um, later in later time, one estimate put it at 170 billion galaxies. 170 billion galaxies. All right, now stop right there. Today, with the sophisticated equipment that we have, what they estimate today is that there are two trillion galaxies. Wow. 
two trillion, and each galaxy has billions of stars. We're talking about numbers here that are like, if you take, you take, the, you take a one and you put 25 zeros behind it, that's 10 to the 25th power, that's what the estimate today of how many galaxies there are out there. So certainly, sand of the seashores, there's somebody estimated that um, because we know what the, the grain of sand about the volume of, and we can kind of outline the, the seashores of different countries so we can kind of estimate what that is. And when they estimate, they say, okay, there are estimates of 10 to the 25 um, uh, number of sands on the Earth. The now with the estimate of the, the galaxies, it's, the estimates are 10 to the 21st power. So we see now that where we started, we thought galaxies were hundreds and thousands and maybe a couple billion and billions. Now we see that the number of galaxies that are out there do, does equal the number of sands that are on the seashore. I'm just saying that this was way before, this was talked about in the Bible way before we, any of us have existed today. The Bible talks about it, all right? So the statements of the Bible are consistent with astronomy. Here's another one. The Bible also says that each star is unique. 1 Corinthians 15, 41. As a matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, just turn there. I'll give you a chance to get there. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 41. Okay, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 41, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. When it's talking about glory, it's talking about its, its shine, right? Of course, we know the moon reflects the sunlight, but there's one glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differeth, differeth from another star in glory. So what the Bible in a sense here is saying that each of the stars is unique. Now, all the stars look alike to the naked eye, even when seen through a telescope. They just seem to be points of light. However, analysis of the, their light spectra reveals that each is unique and different from all others. So just as our fingerprints are different, everyone has a unique fingerprint, all these millions and billions of stars are unique from each other, just as, as snowflakes are unique. And the Bible says it. We couldn't imagine that years ago, but now our discoveries reveal that, that each one has a different spectrum, a different. And so the Bible, long ago, said each one, the glory is different from another one, unique, all right? The Bible describes the precision of the movement in the universe, Jeremiah 31, 35, and 36. And I'll read for you. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. So what he's saying here is that these, this would, the Israel would cease to be a nation before the stars would cease in their orbits and in their motions and in their precision. The Bible describes the suspension of the earth. Again, this is all under, this, under um, astronomy. Job 26, verse 7, he says, He stretches out the north over empty space, and then he hangs the earth on nothing. Right? There was, there was a time when, when people thought that Hercules or some other god or uh, of um, in the mythology was holding something up or was that sitting on a pedestal. Bible says, and this is Job, which is the oldest book of the Bible, it says he hangeth it there on nothing. God placed everything in its orbit in its time. So that's another scientific fact. The Bible describes moving on to meteorology, the branch of science that's concerned with the process and phenomena of the atmosphere, right? Meteorology, we all of us like to try to look at it and see what it's, it's going to rain today or is it going to snow tomorrow or is it going to do that and that. So we're all interested in the weather, right? Ecclesiastes 1.6 says, The wind goes toward the south 
and turns around to the north, the wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. Again, this is Ecclesiastes, long before that we knew. The Bible includes some principles of fluid dynamics, and that's, that's a course that I teach, fluid mechanics and fluid dynamics. Job 28, 25, it says, to establish a weight for the wind, a weight for the wind, and apportion the waters by measure. People didn't, 100, 200 years ago, people didn't know that the, weight, the wind or the air atmosphere had weight to it, maybe a little longer than, than that because it was discovered and so forth. But long before um, the discovery people discovered that the Bible says to establish the weight. This is Job, so this is one of the oldest books of the Bible. To establish a weight for the wind and a portion by method. The fact that air has weight was proven scientifically only about 300 years ago, right? The relative weights of the air and water are needed for the efficient functioning of the world's hydro hydro hydrologic cycle, which in turn sustains life on the earth. Well, what about biology? And I know this is, this is a branch of science that um, Herbert is quite familiar with. He's a, he's a biologist. The branch of science that deals with life and living organisms. In the book of Leviticus, which is written prior to 1400 BC, describes the value of blood. All right, Leviticus 17:11. it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for your souls. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Long before people understood that there was life to blood, they just thought it was some fluid that helped your body do whatever it needed to do. But no, the Bible says there's life in the blood, and we know because we look under microscope, we can see all of that life in the blood, cells, red cells, and white cells, and all kinds of different things that are in the blood. The Bible says, the blood carries water and nourishment to every cell, maintains the body's temperature, and removes waste material of the body's cells. The blood carries oxygen from the lungs throughout the body. In 1616, William Harvey discovered that blood circulation is the key to physical life. 1616, confirming what the Bible revealed 3,000 years earlier. See, if, if Here's the point. If people, science is catching up to where the Bible has already been. And if people, I truly believe that there would be far more discoveries today if people had studied science from the light of the Bible. If they'd looked at the Bible and used that as the measuring stick for studies, that, that, that we would have had much more discoveries today of a great magnitude because the same author of science is the same author of the Bible. Amen. The Bible and the science have to agree. All right, here's an interesting one. Interesting one. The Bible describes the chemical nature of flesh, all right? Now, we just said that the text here, I think uh, Mary Beth read it in the story, Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Do you realize that if you take the human body and by mass, I'm going to give you some percentages here of what composes the body. All right. So the, by mass, the largest percentage of any element is oxygen, 65% by mass. Then carbon, 18.5% by mass. Then hydrogen, 10% by mass. Then nitrogen, 3.2%. Calcium, roughly about 1.5%. And phosphorus, about 1%. These six elements make up about 99% of what we are made up of. That's right. And we still have a few trace elements. We have um, potassium, 0.4%, sulfur, 0.3%, sodium, 0.2%, chlorine, 0.2%, magnesium, 0.1%. And then we have some trace elements that are below 0.1%. Truly, all of these things can be found in the soil, right? All of these things are in the earth. Bible says, what are we made of? We are made of the dust of the earth. Bible says it. Did we just discovered it, these things, in recent centuries, but the Bible proclaims that we are the dust of the earth. All right, Genesis 3.19, in the sweat of your face shall ye eat bread till you, ret till you return to the ground, 
for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Remember when, when those of our loved ones pass away, we say ashes to ashes and dust to dust, you know, as a, as a, a tradition, with traditional um, saying as we're uh, interring, the, interring them. Let's move on to anthropology. The anthropology is the study of human societies and cultures and their development. We have cave paintings and other evidence that people at some certain points in times inhabited caves. Bible also describes the cavemen, Job 35 and 6. They were driven out from among men. They shouted at them. That's Job 30, verse 5 and 6. They shouted at them as a thief. They had to live in the clefts of the valleys, in caves of the earth and rocks. Mm. Now, what I want you to know is that these people who were living looked just like you and me. They weren't eight men. They were not eight men, but descendants of those who scattered from Babel. Remember the Tower of Babel when the language was confused and men and women scattered on the face of the earth to live in different areas. And some lived in caves and other. And we, we've seen uh, depictions and pictures of caves. And here's the thing that I always have to laugh at, or, or I should laugh at, just chuckle at. They say, wow, we see these things, and how could these people do these things? They're so, how could these Cro-Magnon men and Neanderthals, how could, they, how could they do these kinds of things? Well, that's because they had intelligence, because God created them so. God made them that way. It's not that, it's not that, um, they, that they evolved from something and, um, and then got intelligence by just getting, I don't know, evolving to a higher state. No, God made them that way. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up Bible texts. So this is all science that's in the Bible, all right? How about hydrology, which is our water cycle? All right, the Bible reasonably uh, completes descriptions of the hydraulic cycle. For example, Psalms 135, verse 7. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings, wing, he brings wind out of his treasures. So it's describing this, vapors to ascend from the earth. We know the hydraulic cycle, the hydrologic cycle where water evaporates and goes up, makes clouds, and then um, makes rain in places, and that rain gathers and collects in rivers and streams and so forth. Evaporation process, all of this. All of this is described in the Bible. Jeremiah 10, 13. When he utters his voice, there's a multitude of waters in the heavens. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. All long before men uh, dis describe this process. The Bible describes the recirculation of water. Uh, Ecclesiastes 1, 7. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, they return again. Now, how many of you have uh, been to, uh, have had the fortune to, to, to go to or see Niagara Falls? Have anybody here has been able to see? A lot of you have seen Niagara Falls. Now, isn't that an impressive? Yes. I've, I've been there twice, and I, I, I'd like to go back and see it again. It's, it's, it's very impressive to see that amount of water just rushing over and the sound that it makes, and the, 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 just the sheer power that it eviscerates. And um, here you, you know, it's like it's, like it's been doing that forever, it's, it seems, you know. There's a cycle, you know. That water goes somewhere, evaporates, it comes back in the, in the form of rain, dew, and so forth and starts the cycle from somewhere all over again, you know? God describes that, it's described in the, it's described in the Bible, right? Genesis 7:11. in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month and 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. So the Bible talks about a great um, uh, conflagration, a great, Great flood. So these things, these things, are, these things are all in the Bible. Right. And uh, again, men who, who, who are much, men and women who are much smarter than me, um, they talk about this aspect of uh, Herbert and I talk about this. They talk about gases spinning around in space, right? Uh. And at some point in time, these gases cooled off and heated up and coalesced and became this. And it, it sounds like foolishness to me. It, it really does. And again, I'm not trying to disparage what people believe. What I'm trying to say is that 
We serve a God who is a God of purpose, who is a God of order, who is a God of love, who created this world. And, and, and we can trust the Bible. Amen. We can trust it. Here's, here's some statements consistent with geology. The branch of science that deals with the Earth's physical structure. Jeremiah 31, 37. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all Israel, cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. But the first part of the text, talking about foundations of the earth. The Bible describes the shape of the earth centuries before people thought that the earth was spherical. And you can find this in Isaiah 40, verse 22. It says that it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. The word circle here in the Hebrew is a word that's spelled C-H-U-W-G. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, chug, which is translated circuit or compass depending upon the context. That is, it indicates something spherical or rounded or arched, not something flat or square. The earth is not flat or square. Men for centuries thought that the earth was flat until Galileo and Copernicus and those people came along. And some people still do today believe that the earth is flat. <laughs> but the Bible years before said that he says in, in Isaiah, long before, he, he who sits above the circle of the earth. And Isaiah was written sometime about between 740 and 680 BC thereabouts. This is at least 300 years before Aristotle suggested, just suggested that the earth might be a sphere on the book of heavens. You know, he suggested it because the, it was the church that was saying no. It was the, the, that's right. He didn't want to, he didn't want to lose his life for that. He, he just suggested it. I could go on and on and on with statements from that. But, but Colossians 1.17 says, by him, by Jesus, yes. all things consist. The word consist here literally means hold together or cohere. Many Bible translations put it hold together. This is the answer to the nuclear physicist's worry of, worrisome question about the atom. The real mystery of the atom does not involve its benumbing mega power, and we know about the power of the atom when they split it in, to make bombs and so forth. But rather, why doesn't the atom fly apart? Scientific knowledge says it should, but it doesn't. Some scientists are wondering what puzzling power completely unknown to them is holding it together. Well, you need to take them to Colossians 1, 16 and 17, right? By him all things consist. These things just did, didn't come about by random, random acts or so forth. So here's the truth about why the Bible and the, word and, the, and the Word and science agree. Again, science and the Bible have the same author. And I'd like to read a couple uh, excerpts from the Spirit of Prophecy book, Education, Science and the Bible. It says this, since the book of nature and the book of Revelation bear the impress of the same mastermind, they cannot but speak in harmony. By different methods and in different languages, they witness the same great truths. Science is ever discovering new wonders, but she brings forth from her research nothing that rightly understood conflicts with divine revelation. Amen. Nothing in true scientific discovery conflicts with divine revelation. The book of nature and the written words shed light upon each other. They make us acquainted with God by teaching us something of the laws through which he works. That's Education 128, paragraph one. She goes on to say this, inferences erroneously drawn from facts observed in nature have, however, led to supposed conflict between science and revelation. And in an effort to restore harmony, interpretations of scripture have been adopted that undermine and destroy the force of the word of God. You hear people say, the world really could not have been created in six days. How foolish and ridiculous. You actually believe those fairy tales? <laughs> but let me tell you, we have not 
We have not gone after cunningly devised fables. God who created this world in six literal days is the God that pumps the blood in my heart right now as I'm speaking to you and in your hearts as you're sitting there listening to me. That's it. That's why we have hope for the resurrection. That's right. right. Geology has been thought to contradict the literal interpretation of the mosaic record of creation. Millions of years, it is claimed, were required for the evolution of the earth from chaos. And in order to accommodate the Bible to this supposed revelation of science, the days of creation are assumed to have been vast, indefinite periods covering thousands or even millions of years. You've heard some of them. Earth is about, what, they say 65 million years old, right? And the universe is 13.7 or 13.6 billion years old. It's interesting. When they first said it, it was a few billion years old, but then, oh, we discovered more, so it's 12 billion years old. Oh, what? We've discovered more. It's 13 billion years old. Oh, our latest thing is, is 13.6. Now it's 13.7 billion years old is what they... But the Bible, as a clear clarion bell from the beginning said, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth, the seas and the fountains of water. In six literal days, he created this this world. So she goes on to say, such a conclusion, this millions of years, is wholly uncalled for. The Bible record is in harmony with itself and with the teaching of nature. Of the first day employed in the work of creation is given the record. The evening and the morning were the first day, Genesis 1.5. And in, same, in the same substance is said in each of the first six days of creation, the evening and the morning of the first day. Each of these periods, inspiration declares to have been a day consisting of evening and morning. Like every other day since that time, every other day that we have to this day, evening, morning, yes. evening, morning. I could go on for a broken record talking about evening and morning. You wake up, go to bed. The sun traverses through the sky, it sets. Every day. He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast as the testimony of Scripture, Psalm 33, verse 9. With him who could call, thus call into existence unnumbered worlds, how long a time would be required for the evolution of the earth from chaos? In order to account for his works, must we do violence to his word? Goes on to say, it is true that remains found in the earth testify to the existence of men, animals, and plants much larger than any now known. These are regarded as proving the existence of vegetable and animal life prior to the time of the Mosaic record. So there was a time before the Mosaic record. We call these the the antediluvian worlds before the flood. Before the flood, the development of vegetable and animal life was immeasurably immeasurably superior to that which has since been known. At the flood, the surface of the earth was broken up, marked changes took place, and in the reformation of the earth's crust were preserved many evidences of the life previously existing. The vast forests varied in the earth at the time of the flood have since changed to coal. From the from the form the extensive coal fields and yet the and sorry and yield the supplies of oil that minister to our comfort and convenience today. These things, as they were brought to light, as they are brought to light, are so many witnesses mutely testifying to the truth of the word of God. Amen. There's many more things that I could read here, but. I just want to to close um, with some of the thoughts. The Holy Writ, so grand in its simplicity, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, Genesis 1.27. Shall we reject that genealogical record prouder than any treasured in the courts of kings, which was the son of Adam, which was the Son of God, Luke 3.38. You'll find that. Finally, it's all about Jesus. We talk about this in Sabbath school. The focus of everything and the focus of the word is about Jesus. And this is why Satan does not want us to dig deep into the word. And this is why we should do the opposite of what he wants us to do. We need to be, I don't care who 
is going to call me foolish or whatever, in, in, in whether it be colleague or foe or friend or whatever. You will never, never get me to lay aside this precious book right here. The science of redemption, this is what it says about Jesus. What this, it says the science of redemption is the science of all sciences. The science that is the study of the angels and of all the intelligences of the unfallen worlds. The science that engages the attention of our Lord and Savior. The science that enters into the purpose brooded in the mind of the infinite, capital I, talking about God, kept in silence through eternal times, Romans 16, 25. The science that will be the study of God's redeemed, that's you and me, throughout endless ages. This is the highest study in which it is possible for man to engage. Amen. As no other study can, it will quicken the mind and uplift the soul. Education 126, paragraph 2. The excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. The words that I speak unto you, said Jesus, they are spirit and they are life. This is life eternal, that they should know thee, the only true God, and him who thou didst send. Ecclesiastes 7.12, John 6.63. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word of God. Don't let anyone make you believe that by some random process, by some random acts, and by violence, survival of the fittest, that this animal devoured this animal as they were evolving up the chain and devoured this. There's nothing in the record. They, when you dig into the ground, and you go, what you see is a pterodactyl, or whatever, or whatever it is, it's that thing. It's not something changing from something to something else. When you plant seeds in the ground, if I plant an orange tree, a sucker tree, and it gives me oranges, and I take out the seeds and I plant it again, what's going to come up? If I, take <laughs> if I take out those seeds and I plant them again another generation after, what's going to come up? Because God said everything after its own kind. God said it. God said it. God said it. And I believe it. Amen. The creative energy that called the world into existence, into existence is in the word of God. The word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise accepted by the will and received unto the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. The life thus imparted is in like manner sustained by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4, Matthew 4, shall man live. Brothers and sisters, at this time in our earth's history, rather than laying aside the word of God, we should be grasping it and holding on to it and cherishing it and reading it with more urgency. More urgency than 10 years ago or 20 years ago or two days ago or whatever. As we get closer and closer to his return, let us immerse ourselves in the word of God and let him, let him take us through to eternity.